So I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Michael L. Walker, who is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Walker's research broadly examines social control, inequality, stratification, and the human condition, with the focus on emotions, identities, and health in American jails. His work has been published in the American Journal of Sociology and Theoretical Criminology, among other outlets. He's joining us today to discuss his recent book, Indefinite, Doing Time in Jail, which is an ethnographic study of life in the Southern California County Jail System. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Walker, who will speak about the book, and then the Q&A will follow shortly after. So for those on Zoom, if you have any questions, please feel free to just type them in the chat, and we'll have a running queue going. Um, and for everyone else, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Walker. All right, thank you. Um... So I can't see what's there. What's there? I see you, uh, Will. So I see somebody has some some snacks there to eat on, and nobody. <laughs> so that looks that looks. Um, someone someone thought thought properly about this. This is lunchtime. Um, but thank you all for for giving me time to sort of talk about the book and to I look forward to, to questions and comments. And um, I'm actually just happy that somebody has read it. Uh, one of the things that <laughs> that uh, when I first started to to think about how to write this book. Um, and I described this earlier on in the introduction, there was quite a bit of back and forth within myself about whether to even do it. And part of the issue is that, you know, I didn't want to turn my worst time of my life into a study. The other thing that was kind of happening there is that uh, it's a risk, right? So you take a risk as a, as a scholar to write about this type of experience. Um, you know, you don't have control in, in the long run over how people understand you or understand your work. And so, you know, I may think of myself in a particular way, but once I write this, it's going to be received however it's going to be received. That said, well, I should say one other thing. I also didn't want to pretend as if I could speak to the experiences of everybody who's ever been imprisoned or incarcerated. And so those things worried me. It worried me about how, I, how the book would be received. It worried me that it might be, um, I might be taken as having some type of, um, you know, a, a voice that is, uh, you know, worth legitimating all or, or, or has a position to, to a legitimate voice to be able to speak to everybody's experiences. I've never been to prison, so I don't know anything about it. You know, not, not experientially, I should say. And not every jail, of course, is the same. So there's a, those things in mind, I still decided in the end to sort of push forward. When I started to write this, one of the things that I, I knew immediately was that I wanted this to, to be read. So we have a style of writing in, um, in social science whereby you know, we try to write our books in a way that this, they're easy to get through, which is not necessarily the same as saying they're easy to be read. But ethnographic work, I think, um, is not done until the writing is done in a way that presents the work or the data in a way that, that makes sense. So the, the presentation of the data is in the writing and that needs to, to be considered heavily. So I leaned into what it felt like. I tried to give persons who've never been there the, the sense of what it takes to be there, what it looks like to be there. Um, and those who have been there before, I try to give them some sense of um, you know, reminiscence. Like, yes, I understand that experience, even if I haven't had that exact one. I had the pleasure of finding Ken in my book. Um, he and I reunited not too long ago. And it's a sort of an interesting thing to have, uh, to, to have caught up with him and go back and have conversation with him about the things that I experienced and the things that I experienced with him. And, but most importantly, to get confirmation from him, like, okay, yeah, this, this is accurate, this is good. But also to see that he's doing well, you know, he, he finished his 14 years in prison, he's now home and, and living his life properly, you know, the way that he wants to. Um, but he and I talking about this, one of the things he told me was that it is impossible to write the kind of book that I've tried to write, that it is impossible to write a book with one foot in the world of academia and one foot in the world of experiences for those who've been there. So I look forward to hearing whether people think I've accomplished that because that in fact is the, the larger goal for me. Could I write this book that has me in one foot in both worlds? In some regards, the, 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 short, the shortest chapter, the chapter on time is the one that I think is maybe the most important one. It is the one that, that I think drives so much of what we experience while you're incarcerated, particularly in a jail. So I wanna highlight that for a moment. When I was trying to make sense of the nature of time in jail, um, 
you know, as a sociologist, I have a, just running a bunch of running theories of what I think are sort of is important, right? Um, and, I, and I think I, de I detail, you know, this idea that we, that, that time compartmentalizes identities, particularly role identities, and the result sort of compartmentalizes even the way we feel about ourselves and the way we're likely to interact with others. And that's fine enough. That's, I think that's established in one way or another through literature. But jail time is a little bit different. It, it, it becomes a, a thing that you end up feeling like you're fighting against. The way I try to explain it to my students is, you know, imagine that you're sitting in a classroom while, while I'm giving this lecture, and I tell you, you can leave in a week. You know, many students will be upset, but if you know you're gonna get out of here in a week, you're gonna be upset about the things that are happening in your life. You have other things planned, but you know you'll get out in a week and you can adjust for that. But if I tell you, stay here in this classroom until, and I don't tell you when you're getting out and I don't tell you, you know, I come in every now and again, I let one or two students out. Maybe I bring in a few more. That becomes more maddening. Your relationship to time really changes when the time that you're doing is indefinite, when it feels as if there is no specific end to what's going on, what's happening to you. Then you start reaching for, in a very desperate way, anything that will tie you, anything that will tether you to some source of, some sense of social reality, some sense of normalcy, the ability, the, the ability to plan. We've got a little taste of this through the um, uh, pandemic. Many, I remember reading different people saying, you know, this feels like I'm in jail, feels like I'm in prison, whatever else. Um, you know, I think those those uh, those analogies are a little bit overblown. Um, it's not like somebody saying, you know, work is like being slaves. It's like not the same thing at all. But I understand the sentiment that people are trying to make. But the point is, there is this one similarity. When you are, when you, during our time in the, the pandemic, what, one thing we've learned is it's very difficult to plan even six months in advance. For some, when, when the pandemic first hit, you, I couldn't even plan two weeks in advance. You know, where will I be? Like, will I be even teaching in class? I don't know. So if I start teaching live now, will I be able to continue th uh, through the semester? Will I get sick? Will somebody that I love get sick? Um, people, fr family members who I had, who, who I know uh, who had COVID, like, will they survive? Like the ability to plan literally for anything became so difficult that my whole life became just the moment that I had any control over and that was the moment that I was living. That is also what it's like to be in jail. You end up not being able to plan for the future. Well, will I get out in three years? Will I get out in three days? Will I get, you know, um, when I, will something miraculous happen during my court processes that allow me to get out a little earlier or whatever? You know, will, I, will, will a new charge um, be tacked on to what I'm dealing with now, extending the amount of time that I'm here? Well, you don't know, right? You know that you don't know. Like what the, the one thing that is certain is uncertainty itself. And when you're dealing with that level of uncertainty, such, such a, a stark emotional degree of uncertainty, the inability to plan, that affects your self-efficacy. It affects the way your relationship to time itself Future mindedness is not something you can spend, you know, that you can sort of relish in. Instead, you know, you, you relish in the moment that you have any kind of control over. But that's a hard way to live. It's a it's it's difficult on multiple levels. One in, in one way, um, you know, it's hard to plan for what will be happening just tomorrow. Will I get moved out of this particular jail cell? Will I be moved to a different jail in this county? If I get there, what are some of the the ifs or the what ifs or the things that could happen to me there? What are the contingencies of that move? Um, if I'm asked to stay here, will they just bring in somebody that I didn't know before who now is a new problem? Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that we don't know each other, right? Like I think in the movies, um, we follow the stories of people and everybody, people who are incarcerated, we're, we supposedly all know each other, right? Everybody goes in, it's like, oh, my cousins are here. It's a big party. That, of course, is not reality for the vast majority of people who are in, incarcerated. You don't know each other. And there's, it's important to sort of think about what it means to, to have to do time, right, as time as task with people who you might not get along with, people who you find reprehensible, people who find you reprehensible, people with very different types of hygiene standards, people with very different sleeping patterns, people who come in stressed, right, in a very difficult situation. And those types of things, those types of pressures come to bear while you're in jail. 
And the most difficult part about it all, at least for me, was the idea that I wasn't sure when it was going to end. Even with a release date, it was never 100% guaranteed to me that I would get out. And it changes the way that I felt about myself. It changes the way that I thought about, or it changed the way that I thought about liberty itself, about democracy. It certainly changed the way that I thought about the idea of a, uh, a right to a speedy trial. That seemed like nothing. It just seemed like a, you know, words written on a paper somewhere. It didn't have any kind of real meaning. You know, no one tells you when you are incarcerated in a, in a jail that, you know, you could be here for two days or you could be here for 10 years. We just don't know how long it's going to take for your case to be adjudicated. And those, that is such a broad span of time. I remember seeing guys who had, had their bracelets when they first got in. You know, one particular guy that I know, he had a, a slim neck. His build was slim. And you see his, his bracelet, the picture on it, he, it's all tattered. But now you look at him, he's thick necked. He looks like he became a man while he was in jail. Right? He entered as a teenager, as somebody young, and became a man while he was in jail. He put on man weight, his shoulders broadened. This man changed while he was in jail. And he made the argument, a very rational argument, that it's not worth my time to take a plea deal on something that really, if I fight it long enough, I might be able to get out. In the meantime, though, I've got to do this time here, and I don't know how long that's going to be. But the time they're threatening me with is so much longer that I may as well just be here. But he has kids. He had a fa he's got a family. He's got friends and people who care about him. He had work at some point. And I asked him about these things, and he's you know just gives me the shrug like what what am I supposed to do? All I can control is this moment that I'm in right here. This for me is sort of like the crux of what it means to do indefinite time. It is this change in your your uh, relationship to time. It is a change in a relationship to self your relationships with other, you know, just, just general social relationships with other people. Um, and it affects you in a way that I think is hard to really overcome. Someone asked me at a recent event, if there's anything that I, um, if there's any kind of holdovers from jail time. And strangely enough, there are. There are things that, um, that it doesn't take that long to be trained into you. And the difficult thing about that is, this is not how I imagine myself. If someone were to ask me, you know, you know, who are you? I would say I'm a professor of sociology. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I would name all these other things. You know, I wouldn't name I'm a formerly incarcerated person and I have these different things that I still keep with me, right? So this is something in many regards that's, that is from my past, yet I still live with it. I still live with it in a way that I don't really want to. It becomes intrusive. And not even, even though I'm able to sort of give myself some type of emotional distance, academically, right? I have the benefit of being able to do that. Not everybody else does. When I talk to Ken from the book about his experiences today, he still thinks about prison time a lot. A lot of his friends are people who are also in jail or in prison. His whole friendship, his whole network of groups of where he is in, in life is rooted or, or I say is directed or constrained in one way or another by having been in prison. So this new identity is foisted upon him in a way that he doesn't really want. But he also just kind of accepts it. Right. He's he's also a very strange kind of individual. Like I've never met anybody who was so happy and also so dangerous at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, this type of experience, like these these holdovers, the thing that that sticks with me more than anything um, is the idea that I want to be able to control some sense of my own time. I want to have some say over what I do with my time. I want to have some say over how much of my time I spend doing any one given thing. One of my close friends once told me, a friend and scholar, he said, you know, you can think about wealth as, um, as, a, as a sort of a marker of, uh, or so say, you, you can think of time, the, the ability to command some, some measure of your own time as a marker of how wealthy you are. That the idea being that the wealthier you are, the more of your own time that you can command, right? And I remember going to lunch once with a comptroller in a, uh, from a county in, in Southern California. And I was like, yo, I got, you know, he, he invited me to lunch. And I said, like, yeah, I'm happy to go. I've got 30 minutes. He said, well, um, let's go to lunch. You're with me. We had lunch for four hours. <laughs> now, I don't know if he was misappropriating uh, uh, county funds by taking lunch for four hours, but he was not at all concerned about going back in 30 minutes. 
and he makes he made significantly more money than me. But it wasn't even that. It was like he was about to go play racquetball after that. <laughs> and then after, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't like what he was able to do with his time was very different than what I was doing. Penal time reminds me of this idea that I need to have more say over what I do and how I do it. So I wrote indefinite, hoping that um, I would alert us all to these issues, not just with time, but but also some of the emotional content of what it means to be incarcerated. I tried to write it in a way that um, that would make you smell the place, that would make you see what I saw and make you feel what I felt. If not me, then other what other people. I try to write it in a way where um, I'm being true to the fact, uh, to the sort of the emotional content of the place without making it specifically about me, right? There's no way for me to be there and not there all at the same time. Um, so that said, I look forward to any comments, questions, any ideas you may have. I, I just want to have an engagement about the book. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions or anyone on Zoom? Great, I have many questions. <laughs> uh, last is one for now though. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, in your experience, how Dale's shaped mental health and suicidal ideation? And in particular in the book, you, you elaborate on this concept of enduring and how it's different from coping or adapting. I was just wondering if you could say more about that. So there's a, a multitude of ways that you end up dealing with um, mental health or you start to say developing a mental health issue. I mean, so, so suicide is the number one cause of death in, in American jails. I think followed by heart disease, I think is the second one. Uh, both of those things are independently uh, increased or your risk for both of those things are independently increased by your poor sleep hygiene. So poor sleep hygiene is endemic to jail. So that's just one way to think about it. But, but the other thing is you have to remember that people who come in, you, you know, you're not happy to be in jail. Something terrible has, has gone wrong in your life. And now you, found, you find yourself in this moment. And it is such a stressful moment that usually the first people, the, the, it doesn't take long, right? It's like, I think it's like seven to nine days. That's when the vast majority of suicides occur. So it's the initial time being there that is so incredibly stressful that you know, some people can't handle it. I, I, I understand it. I, I get why, why that happens. There is no such thing as real treatment of mental health in jail, right? It is a misnomer. It, we, it exists, right? There are mental health staff and they, they do work there. But as I described, you know, my interactions with Nurse B, the best that I could hope for with her is to find a kind ear. I mean, she's not going to fix the problem. She, it's an impossible task. It's a kind of, a, it's, it's almost ridiculous, I think, to even try to imagine mental health operating in a functional way in a place that's meant to destroy human potential, right? So it's like these two things are in such, at such odds with each other that, you know, it's just never going to work. But not only that, administratively, the motives for what it, what we, the reasons why we have jail and the way that they are run has nothing to do with the care of the, the persons who are incarcerated. Like America has long since shown that we, we, don't, we don't too much care about people who are incarcerated. But if you really wanna get a sense of like how little care people have, you go talk to custodial workers. They'll tell you they don't care, right? If they don't tell you that, they show you that, that they don't care. And so you're not gonna have successful mental health treatment in a jail. I, I just don't even know, I can't even imagine what that would really look like. So what you end up doing though, while you're in jail, if you're incarcerated is, you don't ever get to the point where you feel like I'm coasting. I got this, right? I understand. You may get to the point where you understand what is happening. You understand the parameters of things that could happen to you. And you understand that, that the parameters are wide, right? Literally anything could happen to you on any given day. You could be having breakfast one morning, talking with somebody else and get, you know, jumped from the back. You know, that could happen, right? So you don't have to have done anything necessarily. I remember one of the guys in the book, I think I called him LK. He said, uh, it's said to me at some point that, that we're lucky in the housing unit that he hasn't gotten tired of seeing the faces in there because he would do something about it. So that level of volatility, right? That's always there. I mean, what do you do with that? You never get to the point where you're like, I can cope with this. I got this. I'm adapted to this. I understand this. I can do, I can account for this. You can't. So what you do instead is you're just trying to endure it. And you have to know going in that you won't be able to endure forever. You will never have a point where you are completely adapted to that type of situation. 
and your endurance will necessarily fail. When it fails, this is the experience of what I call, this is what hard timing it looks like. All of the things that were happening in the jail are still happening, but now your emotional, uh, your ability to sort of build an, an emotional wall and endure through has broken down, at least temporarily. It could be for a day, it could be for 10 minutes, it could be for three years, it just depends. How long will it take you to be able to recover? It depends on the event. There's so many variables there that I'm not, I, I hesitate to offer like, this is what will lead to it. Um, I was giving a talk in a college classroom um, last week and uh, one of the students in there said that her father has been incarcerated for half of her life and that when uh, one of his cellmates committed suicide, it gave, it sent him, as she said, into the doldrums. Mm -hmm. uh, it sent him hard timing it and it took him a long time. It took him weeks, several weeks to come out of that. So, you know, it's, it's how do you endure, the, like, how do you endure knowing that somebody in the cell that you were with just committed suicide? You're not, in, and the fact is you really do have to just continue on. You really don't have any other kind of choice. Mm -hmm. So it's not coping though. And it's certainly not ad adapting. Um, I don't even like the connotations. I know those those two terms are very uh, like you know they're they're wide in the literature. I just don't like the connotations. But more importantly, they just don't seem to capture the experience of it. Like what you feel like you're doing more than anything else is just trying to survive, and you have to know that at some point you won't be able to at least for a little while. But we're talking about the sort of an emotional level here, right? Um, you know, physically you may feel perfectly fine. Um, you physically you may be great. In fact, you may be in the best shape of your life in many, in many regards. But emotionally, and there's, you know, it could be a very different situation. You could be a wreck. And there isn't anybody necessarily that you can go to. If you're hard timing it, going to the, 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 the jail psychiatrist is going to offer you very little. Going to speak to the nurses, depending on which, which one you get. And if you're in an institution in which the nurses are effective, you know, maybe they're effective communicators, you'll be better off. But you're not going to get treatment, right? Like in the way that we would imagine treatment, right? If you or I here in free society were to go to a mental health professional, we're more likely to get a better response than what we're almost guaranteed to get in, in, in a jail. Uh, yeah, Adam. Um, so can you hear me? I just want to. Yeah, change. I can hear you. Cool. Um, so I do some work looking at plea bargaining. And you mentioned in your introduction, one man discussing his experience with deciding whether or not to take a plea bargain. He said that it wasn't worth it because the amount of time he could get was so large that he might as well wait. Um, I am wondering if you could speak a little bit more about uh, the other stories that you heard, because my sense is that as your pretrial detention time extends and you're enduring, more and more, um, you might be more likely to take a plea deal, but I suspect it's a lot more complicated than that, and I'm just speculating. So um, could you speak more about other experiences you heard while you were there? Yeah, it, 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 so you may be more likely, but you're right, it is more complicated. So the fact is, you know, the, the guys that I met that had been there for two years, three years, four years, nine years, their, their, their cases have yet to be adjudicated. They haven't given in. They haven't given in, they haven't said, okay, whatever you're offering me, I'll take it, right? They're not pushing for that. Now, some of them know they're not pushing for that because it does, legally it doesn't make the sense to do it. Like, well, I, you might, you're drawing out this case and you know, this is the way our criminal justice system works, right? So we will threaten you or punish you so much, so heavily that you at some point would be beaten into just accepting something, right? And just, just to be able to get out. Just to be able to say, I have some, I want to, like, what's the next step? All right, if I'm going to prison, let me go, right? If I'm going home, let me go. But it's not as simple as just saying, it's been, I'm sick and tired of being here. I mean, people fight their cases. Uh, it was just a, a common thing to just fight your case. Now, if you thought you had a completely losing case, there was no hope, no chance. If you're one of those people who had a public defender who hardly ever, who you hardly ever saw, which is a lot of people, um, if you were being told by your public defender to, to give in, which is also a lot of people, um, then yeah, you might be more likely to accept the deal, particularly if you feel like you don't have as much to lose, right? If you feel like, all right, I've been in and out of jail at some different point, or if there's less going on in the free, in the free world for me, or um, you know, there's, there's, I'm, not, I'm not missing out on anything as much as 
it, and I and I kind of need to just make make a decision like about what's about to happen to me. That said, that's a hard sell too. Right? <laughs> it's not an easy thing. Just because your public defender says accept the deal doesn't mean you will. I have been told to accept the deal. I didn't automatically take the first deal I was given. Right. I remember being in, in visitation um, and having the, the sort of secure room off to the, to the left of me where you're supposed to be able to sit and talk with your uh, your lawyer in a, in a quiet space and no one can hear and everyone can actually, we can all hear everything that's being said in there. And I remember the lawyer explaining to this person like, yo, you're in a bitch of a county. This is what they're gonna do to you. And I remember that dude saying, yeah, but I'm a child. Like, he, like you're talking about giving me so much time that when I'm done, I will be a full on like adult. I can't just accept this time just because you're saying it. And the lawyer's like, well, you know, take it or leave it basically. I'll, you know, you got to make a decision. You got to make the decision now. Well, you know, if you put people's back, backs against the wall like that, you don't know necessarily what they're going to get, right? So I think, in, I don't know that there's a way to sort of um, predict the likely out outcomes. What we do know is obviously that, you know, what is it like, what's the number? Like 98% of cases are, settled by a plea deal. So they're doing like, so the system understands how that works, right? So like people know how to pull on those triggers because people are accepting the plea deals. Um, mm -hmm. That said, there's enough people not doing it that mm -hmm. you have, you can build social structure inside of, an, of, of a jail because that many people are saying, I'm not accepting this and I've got to be, I got to fight this case. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can push too hard. First and, off, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm just wondering, do, if you're saying, is it possible to build a community within the jail at all? Like, will you be able to like build friendship along with your cellmates, and through that friendship, you sort of create this community that will help you to deal with your like mental health issues? Well, we're all human beings. I think we have to remember that. You know, I think humans have a, you know, we we desire to work in groups. Right, quite almost quite naturally, we want to be in groups. Group identities are really, really important for us. Um, and I don't think anybody wants to live in total disorder, right? Everybody wants to develop some sense of order. One of the examples I usually use whenever this this question like this comes up is: so in Los Angeles, for example, the A Trade A Trade Gangster Crips um, control a part of LA that is um, south of. Um, Florence Avenue, that you don't have to know any of this, but just, you just need to know that Florence Avenue is a major thoroughfare, but it's also sort of the border between two major gangs, a Trade Gangster Crips, Rolling Sixties uh, Crips. Uh, these two groups cross these bo that border all the time. They're not in constant open war, right? They have their sworn enemies, but even they want some sense of order, right? Even they want to maintain a, like no one wants to live in, in the, even in the threat of constant war. So in jail, part of the reason why you make friends with people is because you're literally just with these people all the time. You're, it's, it's very difficult to just do your time all by yourself. That's, that's almost an impossibility. You'd have to be sitting to a secure housing unit within the jail. But if you're in the housing unit, you're not going to be permitted to be all by yourself. Now, you might not develop friends because people may ignore you, but that puts you in peril. So what ends up happening is, yeah, you develop friendships with your, your cellies. I had many times where I laughed and joked with people. You get to know them, you, they talk about their families, you talk about your own family. It, does it help, you know, are you building community? Not exactly, because it, it depends on how you define community and what you expect of a community, right? So one of the things that was true was that somebody would always promise, oh, I'm gonna write y'all, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And then they get out and they don't do any of those things. Right. Even I made that promise and I didn't do that. I wrote two letters and that was it. And I had planned to write more. I'm, I'm sure other people plan to write more, too. And you just don't do it because your own life is happening. Um, and no one really holds that against you because it's like, well, this is what we all do. Right. While we're here. Yeah, we're together when we're not here anymore. I don't need to be holding on to that. Right. I ran into one of the guys that I was with. I ran into him uh, at a church. He pretended like, like I didn't exist. You know, I thought it was funny because I'm like, I get it. I get it. You know what I mean? I was just happy to see him. But at the same time, he didn't want to talk. What, what, you know, what are we going to talk about? We only have one thing in common right now. So I don't know where his life is or what he's doing, um, but I understood it. So it's community while there. Community might be too strong of a word. Uh, it's sort of like a temporary group identity that develops um, 
but and it's forced right it's forced upon you you are with the blacks you're with the soft siders you're with the woods whatever else like you don't have a choice really you're in this housing unit you're going to hold down this housing unit your particular racialized group you ain't got no choice to, but what to do so you find a way to get along because you have to get along i don't know that that necessarily makes it does it make it easier to do your time to some degree yeah it would certainly be much worse if you didn't get along with everybody that would be much harder but it, it, it's not a sustained community in the sense that when you come home, you want to reach back. Um, one of my cellies, <laughs> I think I call him flipping the book. He had been out, he had been in and out. And both times he had promised this other guy uh, that he was going to take care of him. And both times he didn't do it. Right? So he, he's like, he, he was in with this guy. He leaves. Um, he, he, right before he leaves, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to send you money, put money in your books, this, that, and the other. You're close to me. We're friends. He leaves, he goes, he goes home, he doesn't think of he doesn't think about him at all. He gets rearrested, he's back in jail in the same house unit, and he finds it again. They're talking, whatever else. The, the, in the time that I was in, he leaves for his second time. And he tells the same guy, man, I'm gonna take care of him. He tells me the story about how he had told him before. Did he do it? No. He didn't write, he didn't write anybody. That community is so, so temporary that I don't even know that we could call it that. But you definitely do need to get along with people because, you know. Just it's like being it's like any place else, right? You may hate all your peers in this room, but you learn to interact with it with everybody in a way that's that make you know that's cordial. If for no other reason, then it's easier to come to school if if you get along with people, right? You may hate all of them, hate their guts, it don't even matter. That's not what you display on a regular basis. And jail is no different. Hmm. Yeah, I um, can you talk a bit about um, the interplay between racialization as an institutional tool and the politics among residents? Yeah, so um, so one thing about the politics, keep in mind that is that they're functional. That's it. They don't it doesn't mean that they're good or bad. like you can't really offer a moral you know, critique of this, right? This system. It just works. Right, there are many other systems that would work just as well. It it works only because people give into it, right? So in the trustee pod, for example, race, there are no racial politics. People fight hard against it. The deputies don't institute it, and the penal residents won't accept it, right? Now you go into the pre housing holding cells. Deputies don't institute it. Penal residents won't accept it. You go to the court holding cells. Very different place. Deputies don't institute it, but it's already been instituted in the uh, in the the housing units. So when you get to the courthouse, now you've got you got individual beefs, you got group level beefs, and you've got this racialization project that has been foisted upon you as well. All of that is going to be is going to help to organize how people interact in the court holding cells. Not to mention the fact that you're going to court and things are going to be you're more likely to get a bad outcome than a positive one. But this nature of racialization, the main thing that it does for the jail is it legitimizes the jail, right? So one of the strange things about penal policy, and this is just a, an issue in some institutional fields, right? So you take on a policy, and I think it's called, the term is institutional myths. You take on a policy that doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. But you take it on because everybody else in this institutional field, all the other organizations are doing the same thing. So you do it because it adds legitimacy to you. See, we're just like all of them. Right? We're all doing the same thing. We're all doing it wrong the same way. Right? It doesn't matter if it doesn't work, but at least we are legitimated by doing it that way. But you can talk, I talk to deputies like, yo, you see how ridiculous this is, right? Like you see this doesn't work. When I came home, I called the California Department of Corrections and asked uh, one of the correctional officers who answered the phone about racial politics. And he said with a smile on his voice, we don't segregate by race. And then hung the phone up. Well, of course you do. Right, like what are you talking to me? But you could like he it's like that. So why they do it though? I think they do believe that it works, but they're also not investigating. They're not bothering to look around and to note like you know what? We don't need it over here. We don't use it over there. We don't do it here. We don't do it there. This policy is not something that we've just instituted as a blanket um, policy that that makes sense. That helps to deal that like, that we can actually use race to make the lives of the penal residents better and to do make management better. Reason. So when some housing, the housing units that they decided to do that, they just have just decided to do it. They don't have any good reasons to continue the process. 
but they do nonetheless. One of the things that, that is also sort of important here is that um, in Southern California, La Eme, the Mexican mafia, has a lot of sway over what, how the jails are organized. And Mexicans don't like Black folk in, in Southern California. This is a general statement, of course, but particularly in the jails, right? So there's, there's a, um, and one of my good friends, uh, another scholar, Randall Contreras, is just uh, reading his, reviewing his book right now um, on, Mex on relationships between um, intra or interracial um, uh, racism between Mexicans and, and Blacks. Um, and so he's hitting on things that, that if you live in Southern California, you just know. But, but the point here is that to some degree, the jails could always, could always just say, well, you know, the Southsiders are running things here and this is what they want. The reality though, is that it's only a few people in Southsiders who cared all about race like that. Everybody else who's in the pre-housing holding cells, even the senior people who, the, the more, uh, or the people who've been there and sort of know what the rules are, even they relax. They relax in, in, the, in the, uh, the mental health holding cells. They relax in the pre-housing holding cells. They relax in, uh, during visitation. We're all in a room smaller than my office right here, right, together. So if someone hated me, they, didn't, they don't have to sit right next to me. They could come up with some rule for that, but they don't, right? So it's only in the housing units where the deputies benefit from this type of system. The whole thing is just a, a way of managing people. That's it. It is not this, it's classification for the, for the point of view or for the, for the sake of governance, that's it. Um, it, is no, it is of no benefit to the penal residents themselves, but um, you know, at least not, like, not inherently, but if you're gonna have a system, a managing system that offers some form of order, people will accept it, right? Even if they hate what it does, they're like, well, this, if nothing else offers me order. And if you're a new person who's come into this jail, you don't have any say. You can't, you know, it's not like taking a job at a, at a doctor's office as a nurse and saying, you know, why are we change? Why don't we change the rules here a little bit to fit what I like, right? You might have some more sweat, more say in the office where you can sort of look around and see with new eyes what the policies are missing. It ain't like that in jail. You're going to get in and you're going to fall in line. You're going to fall in line or you're going to get roughed up. Um, based on your interaction with the people serving time in jail, could you tell like who actually have a claim of innocence? Nope. And not only that, I never gave it a single thought. It never occurred to me to worry about whether anybody was innocent or guilty. The only time that that ever even came up. Um, so Cisco admitted to his, he's like, yeah, this is what I did. Um, D double talked about doing I don't even know what his what his charges were, but whatever they were, he just said, yeah, he plans to get better at doing it when it gets out. Um, and then there was the one gentleman, uh, I think I called him TJ, who uh, was in for domestic violence for beating his his pregnant wife with a trophy in a broom. That was like so it bothered me that bothered me morally um, before I sort of checked myself and realized like I'm not in a position to say anything like I'm in jail with this guy. Who am I to who am I to look down upon him? But I never worried about anybody's charges. Uh, Toll was in for uh, I think attempted murder. He swore he didn't do it. I didn't believe him or not believe him. I just didn't even care. It just didn't even occur to me to think about it. Um, there were a couple of others. There's one other guy whose name I forget the fake name I gave him. I can only think of his real name right now, so I'm not gonna say it. But I remember him. He's in the book. He's he's like 18 years old. He and I have a conversation in which he says that if he gets life, he's just gonna kill himself. He definitely didn't do it. I'm sure, he's the only one I'm sure, actually. So yeah, let me, let me admit that. He's the only one I'm sure it didn't do it, right? He wasn't even there. And the only reason I know that is because Toll was like, yeah, he's connected to my case and this dude wasn't even there, right? So it's like, okay, so someone else is, is vouching and saying he wasn't there. So I'm like, but other than that, you know, there wasn't a lot of discussions about, did you do it, did you not? There, aren't, there, there did not develop in this housing unit or any others that I had been in, this hierarchy of, of charges. Right. The only thing that was clear is you know, the real high grade was between general population in general and those who are in protective custody. But if you're in for, for attempted murder, you're not, you know, you're not, you don't have a greater level of prestige. People don't look up to you as like, oh man, you really killed somebody. You're, you're a great guy. That's not how it works. <laughs> I, maybe that's how it works in the movies and maybe that's how it works in prisons. I don't know. But my experience has been and the conversations I've had suggested that's not even how it works in prisons, that you're not, you know, so being the most violent guy doesn't make you doesn't give you a greater level level of prestige in fact the best thing you can be is a politician somebody who's who has the ability 
to interact with a lot of different types of people. Somebody who has the ability to smooth social interaction instead of creating more friction. And that doesn't have anything at all to do with whatever your charges are. So I have a bit of a, a methods question. Um, in the book, I thought it interesting that you, you know, you interacted with a lot of different folks that work in the jail. And you talked a little bit about the deputies and how you got them to open up a little bit. So I was wondering, one, for, for people who may not be super familiar with ethnographic methods, so how did you develop those strategies while you were in there to get people to open up? And once they opened up, for instance, when you heard about their job motivations and how a lot of them, it was just a job. There was no, it wasn't like a higher calling or something about justice. Um, when you heard those motivations, how did that shape the way you perceived their behaviors? So um, the first part is that I did what I thought was natural. So I'm a black American, code switching is common, right? It's super common. It's not, it's, not, it's not uncommon to all of us. In fact, I think it is super, all of us have to code switch at some point. You know, most of us can't speak with, you know, whoever you perceive to be a man or a woman, you usually don't have the exact same type of conversation. You don't have the same type of conversation with a senior colleague that you might with somebody who's junior to you. You may talk to your parents very differently than you talk with your boss. And the point is you code switch, with all of these different interactions. But I also have to code switch. I also understand. So while in jail, you know, <clears throat> I, I am 6'4", 260 pounds. I, I have long since lost my hair, long, many, many years ago. Hmm. Uh, but it's growing in because I'm a germaphobe and I refuse to use the clippers that everybody else uses. So my hairlines would start back here and it was long. So I looked like crazy, like George Jefferson. But I was muscular at the time. My mustache hair had grown over my top, over my top lip. My beard hair had just grown wild as hell. Um, and so I just looked crazy. I'm sure I did. I know I did because I used to get clowned all the time while in the gym. Like, yo, man, why don't you get your hair cut? They, people, they would talk crazy about me. But I refused. I wasn't going to clip my fingernails in there. None of that. I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. Uh, <laughs> and so thank you. I'm glad that that gives you, puts a smile on your face, Martha. <laughs> but, but, my, but I... I refused to change because I'm like, I can't, I, the idea that everybody using these clippers, like I know some of your hygiene routines, I can't do it. <laughs> I, so how do I, looking the way that I look, adapt myself to have a conversation with people who already think the worst of me? Well, this is not very different from just being black and in academia, right? I, I have a, a, a suspicion of what it means to how I should say, I have, have a sense of how I live in the minds of other people. And I have developed over time a sense of, or a way of trying to make myself seem smaller, make myself seem more agreeable, smiling more when I don't want to, opening, you know, raising my eyebrows more um, when I don't want to. My natural, my natural eyebrows are, are arched. So when the sun is in my eyes, this is how I look. <laughs> so if I'm straining, I'm trying to see, like right now I can't see anything. This is how I actually look. Well, this is. It, depending on how my eyebrows look, I might look angry to the average person. So I've learned to not do that, right? To raise my eyebrows. These are all things that I've learned naturally. Just like somebody, uh, one of my close friends, this woman is fine, right? And she would always talk about how she's, how, how she's learned to turn men down. She's like, I've learned that I can't just say no. I've learned that I can't just offer a fake number because they'll call it right, they'll call it immediately. So she's developed all these strategies through experience for how to nicely let men down, make them feel as if they're good because there's so many shitty men that she meets that she's had to develop a strategy for how to do it because she understands how she is perceived in the, in the minds of these ridiculous men. Similarly, I had to do the, a, a similar kind of thing, an, an analogous thing. So I learned that I tried other things, right? I tried to have a conversation with deputies just by talking with them, right? I learned very quickly that ain't gonna work. They're not gonna just talk to me. So switching from more slang to a, or less slang to a college educated diction help, mm -hmm. right? The average person doesn't use the word process unless they're like working in some type of formal process. Just saying process oftentimes changes something. If I ask them, yo, why do you all do this the way you do? Versus, well, how did this process develop? That's a very different type of question. <laughs> it's the same question really, but it's a very different form of the question, right? How did this process develop? And this is like, so using those little words here and there, then I'd get the look. 
<laughs> what are you doing in here? How'd you get here? Right? Mm -hmm. Who are you? When I got that look, then I knew I got him. Like, oh, okay. All right. Now they're listening to me. But I also figured out just through trial and error that asking people about themselves was the best way to go. Now, when I was an undergraduate student, uh, Dr. Gary Dembski was an economic, uh, and he's, I was, my undergrad degree is in economics. And I went to speak to him about um, his, he had a summer program that had already ended. And uh, one of the black professors in the department told me, go talk to him, find out what he, you know, like look at his research, go talk to him about his research, see if he'll, he'll figure out a way to let you in. This is how she said it to me. Go talk to him, talk to him about his research, see if he'll let you in. I read that or I heard that and I heard, go schmooze with this guy and see if you can make him feel good enough to where he'll offer you something that you're already too late to get. And that's what I did. I went and I read, I didn't understand the, the articles, right? I couldn't understand it, to be honest with you. I didn't understand advanced econometrics. I didn't have any sense of what he was doing, but I read the, the abstracts and I understood that. And then I read the conclusions. And I went to the office and I talked to him about his work. I asked him questions. And from that, he was impressed. He sat back in his chair and he said, you know, I have this minority research fellowship program that's happening over the summer. You missed the deadline, you would be great for it. Oh, will I? I didn't even mention it the whole talk. I waited, he brought it up. All I did was tell him that something he was doing was worth it. Most people feel unappreciated. Most people feel as if no one sees them. Just asking a deputy, yo, why'd you take this job? What made you want to do it? And asking it in earnest, instead of just asking as if I'm just waiting to get an answer so I could ask the next question, that matters. And I got a much better response that way. So I made it a habit, right? That's how I got around and you know, getting through, um, you know, answering questions and sort of gaining data, at least we're talking with deputies. Uh, I forget now, having given uh, two, two side stories, like what the second part of your question was. <laughs> oh, it was just sort of, once you heard their motivations, how did that shape it for you thought about what they were doing? It didn't, it didn't, it didn't change anything. All it did was confirm something for me. So I'm an army brat and I, I lived, um, I was, you know, I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. I lived in Stuttgart. I graduated high school in South Korea. I've, my mom was, a, you know, my father um, died while I was five, but he was in the armed forces as well. My mother did 22 years and speaking with and talking and being around people who are in armed forces, the vast majority of them don't care at all about the army, right? There are some people who are like true patriots, but they are rare. Most other people, yo, this is an opportunity in one way or another, right? Like it was an opportunity. I, I didn't have anything else to do or I wasn't qualified for anything else or somebody told me go do this or recruiter came to my school right at the right time. It was like happenstance. People just fall into the armed forces. And my mother used to always say, don't ever join the armed forces for this very reason, that nobody seemed to be happy that they were there. They, you build a career if you do it, but the way you got there wasn't, this strong desire to protect America from the rest of the world, right? Instead, it was like, I wanna travel, or this is a good job, or I want some training, or I want the GI Bill, or they'll help me with buying a home later on. And so I wasn't shocked to learn that deputies and custodial workers don't do this from some general sense of loyalty to the law. That instead it was, I passed a test. I went with the homie and he passed a test. I went with my sister and she passed a test, so I took it too. Literally it, right? I applied to two or three different jobs. This one called me back first. Mm -hmm. I would have been a mechanic, but this is the, the place that hit me back first. You know, like I'm not shocked by that. I think there's a mythology around criminal justice and around, um, you know, so, uh, service in the armed forces that we want to foist upon these people. We want them to be heroes. And they do a, they do a job that maybe the rest of us don't want to do. But that's not the same as saying they're not compensated. And that's definitely not the same as saying that their motives for doing it are because they think, you know, this is going to improve the lives of the world. For many people, it's just literally a matter of this is a job I took because it was available. I'm currently doing um, interviews in a large Midwestern uh, law enforcement agency. And almost everybody that I speak to also has the same answer for why they took the job. It's just convenient, good pay good retirement benefits, nothing to do with the law. <laughs> some, of them, some of them say this, some of them do it said, but the ones who say it, it's hard to determine like, whether, like do you really mean that? You know, or do you, they just say it like they say it in such a way it feels like, yeah, like you feel like you're supposed to be saying that. And the more we talk, the more I realize that's not even the true answer. I don't know what it is, but it's not what you said earlier. There are some who are very open and honest, like, yo, there's good benefits here. 
right? Some people who just did it because it was exciting. Okay, so we have uh, one question from chat and then I see one hand up. <clears throat> so this question is, could you speak a little bit about the relationship with your professors in graduate school? How do those relationships evolve from beginning school to going to jail to returning to school and completing this work? That's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked this question. So um, this is interesting. So when I got, so the first time I was ever arrested, it was school was just like the quarter had just got going or was either that or it just was about to start. I think I can look at the dates, um, but it's not that terribly important to me, but I remember it being early. And I remember telling Scott Brooks, who I found out later on was my cousin by marriage, <laughs> who's an ethnographer. Um, and he's like, well, you know what you got to do? You got to write about it. He didn't say turn it into a research project. He just said, you got to write about it. So he didn't say, yo, what the hell's wrong with you? He said, you got to write about it. I was in graduate school. So it wasn't as if, it, it, there was no sense that this was about to be who I am from going forward. Then as I was, in, then that first year of grad school, I did well. I had intended on, um, you know, focusing my areas of specialization going to be general theory and social science. And in that, uh, that department, those two areas are really, really difficult. And mostly because people, the professors were trying to weed people out of them, particularly students of color. And so I, it was, it was, there was a likelihood that I wasn't going to be, you know, people were pushing against me. But I, but I had won the, not the admiration, but I had at least won the respect of professors in the department in that first year. And, but then when I started having to go to court more often, right, so I had been arrested a total of four times altogether. But the court cases in between that, felt like it was just constant. I felt like that's all that I was doing. Scott Brooks at one point did show up to court, right? Um, Edna Bonisic, um, she wrote a letter for me. Um, Ellen Reese wrote a letter for me. Ellen Reese called me the night before I surrendered myself for the 180 day sentence and offered, she's the one who suggested to me, hey, you should pay attention to what you see. I didn't know her at that, at that point, didn't really have any kind of real interactions with her. So I was more angry with her, but she was she saw maybe an opportunity there. But it didn't change. Like I did, if if they felt some kind of way about me, they kept it to themselves. Mm -hmm. If they felt like I was dangerous or like maybe I didn't belong there or they were gonna have an issue, they kept it to themselves. And I have to, I tend to think that they didn't feel any kind of way, because this is not a department full of professors who kept anything to themselves when they didn't like you. <laughs> so I assume that they they were okay with it. When I came back, when I finished, um, you know, finished jail time, I worked a, a crap job. I got married to a woman who, who like I always say to, to her, like, you, it look, it's like she picked up a nickel, a dirty ass nickel, and then wiped it off and put it in her pocket. And it's like, one day this is going to be a quarter. And like, you know what I mean? Like, that's what she did. She was already successful. Um, so I had like, so when I came back, and now I come back with a, with a woman who's got my back and who's sort of supporting me. I come back with data right, if I decide to use it as such, and even John Turner, who was known as a hard ass in our department, even he wrote a letter, he was like, why are they asking you, asking me, why are they asking you to write a research paper on people, on, on the, the effects of, of uh, parents who are incarcerated on their kids, like, this is a ridiculous ask to get back into grad school, we've all voted for you to come back, what's the problem, so I didn't, I didn't develop this negative sense, I didn't have a negative relationship with anybody in the department, the other thing, though, is that um, maybe I'm unusual. I didn't get in the mix of the infighting in the department, right? I didn't, I didn't do any of that. I was a single father. And when I returned, I was still a single father. And I, I was focused on being the very best sociologist I could possibly be. And I, I, I worked with a chip on my shoulder to prove people wrong. So I, they didn't have to say anything to me. I had it in my own head that I, I had stuff to prove. But they, I had a tremendous amount of support. I mean. Nobody made it difficult for me. I can say that. Mm -hmm. Fortunate, really. So I think for the final question, uh, Martha, if you want to unmute. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kevin, for organizing. Thank you, Michael, for being here. It's so fun. It's so fun to hear from you. I read your work a long time ago, and I was like a first year grad student. So um, this is really great. My question builds off the one that was asked right before. So I'm a first year faculty member in a criminal justice sciences department in the Midwest. 
and you know a bunch of my students want to go into law enforcement and so I also had this like intuition one of my students is interviewing with Chicago PD and also with Bloomington PD and he's so excited I was you know I was supportive I also wanted to tell him like I, I had this intuition like you like take this inclination not intuition inclination to tell him why don't you take some notes I mean I didn't tell him that yet but I'm like maybe you could do something maybe this could be like a two-year project where then you go to grad school and then <laughs> write a book but you know I haven't had this conversation with him and I'd be curious to hear your advice or your experience with students who are interested in going into law enforcement and from from your perspective like do you guide them do you just let them do what they're going to do that's my question so okay so that's a little bit, there's a couple of questions in there. I'm gonna to try to see if I can address all of that. And if I don't, just let me know, I'll, I'll try to. So it's important to note that when I was, when I was going to jail, like the two or the time, three of the times that I got arrested and went to jail, I wrote about those, but I was still a graduate student. So, but I wrote about, I wrote about them from a very deeply personal way. The, the last time I went, I was, I had been kicked out of the school. I wasn't, a, I wasn't even a student. I was just Michael, you know, in the world. So that, help that's important because that helps to to get around irb in one way or another right it's like well how do i write this book right while being in jail while well, i'm writing a book about my experiences i just happen to be a sociologist also if i were doing this again i think it would be incredibly difficult for me to, to have gotten it okay it wouldn't have been impossible but i don't think i could have gotten okay that i'm gonna go to jail and then do a study right i don't think i, I wouldn't i don't even know how if that's i can't even imagine how that would work but if you're going to be working as a police officer and then studying policing also, that's a difficult thing to do for a lot of different reasons. But this person may end up having to, if, if they're, so if they're going to still be in school or associated with an, associate, uh, an institution, then they're going to have to go deal with IRB at that particular school, right? Whatever, whatever the difficulties that come with that. But if they're not, I absolutely advocate taking, taking notes, pay attention to where you are because it's your personal experiences. And if you have, you're inclined to, to, to turn a sociological gaze to them, it can only benefit you, right? Who knows what you would do with it in the end? When I was writing while in jail, I had no idea that I was even going to go back to grad school. I thought my life was over. I was not expecting to write a book, not at all. I, had, <laughs> I thought, this is, I'm just doing this because this is my natural inclination to do. And even though Ellen is visiting me, I'm just doing it now because, just because. Right, and if one day I stop doing it, it is what it is. I don't like. What am I supposed to? What do I have to hope for? But if this person is going to go and and go through like the training program, I'd say hold on to those materials. Keep track of what you're going, what you're doing, what you're experiencing. I would again just tell them the same thing Ellen told me. Right? You know, it might be worth you paying attention and writing down what you see. Right, you don't know how you're going to use it, particularly if you're only going to do it for a little while. And I will say this: one of my colleagues. Um, Kevin McCaffrey, who I forget what school he's at now. Dude is brilliant. But anyway, we were in grad school together. And Kevin McCaffrey said that for a little while, he had, he had gone through police training. He had gone through post and he had became an officer. And he did that for like a couple of months. And he describes this feeling that I now have experienced gone, having gone and done ride-alongs. And I can only call it like the seductions of law enforcement, right? Sort of thinking about Jack Katz's work. But so the, so the seduction is this. There's a moment when everybody is like mounting up, you're having a huddle to decide right before you go execute a warrant. And you know what? It's exciting. Even though you like, even me knowing, having some, like having been on the pointy end of the criminal justice system, it's exciting to be in that huddle. Now, when I talked to Kevin McCaffrey about it years ago, he was telling me how it was exciting. And I thought that was strange, but he paid attention to that. He was like, I'm better suited as a sociologist, but I did that, but he didn't write about it. And I wish he would have. I'm sure he wishes he would have. So me writing about it now, I'm writing about it as I'm doing a ride along. But if you have somebody who's going to do it and like this is their job, they get to, if they want to, document the moral changes if there are any, or the, the I, I, identity changes if there are any, there will be some, or the emotional changes that they experience in the sort of their moral career of going through law enforcement. I would love to read that. I'd love, to, I'd be dying to know what that experience is like. Right. I'll I'll let him I'll let him know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So be, yeah, please do. You know, I don't know how to guide anybody through that necessarily, but I would just be constantly talking to him like, yo, right, every night you need to come home and write down what, what happened, even if you think it wasn't important. The smallest details, all those things matter. 
don't know if I caught everything, but if I did, if there's something else, I'm happy to try to address it. Um, all right, so we've reached time. Thank you again, Dr. Walker, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.